dirt road going to the main part, uh, which was the original road going into Fort Henry, there's a readout on the ridge that we think might have been built by the Union garrison. It'll be held, Fort Henry is going to be held basically for the rest of the war, as will Fort Hyman by the federal troops, just as part of the lines of communication. One of the uh, units that will frequent this area is the 83rd Illinois Infantry. They're from the northwestern part of the state around Knox County, Galesburg. There are two men that are members of the 83rd that will go on to do uh, uh, prominent things. One of them is Virgil Earp. Wyatt's older brother. There are two other Earps in the 83rd Illinois. Uh, Wyatt was too young to serve. Uh, Virgil got to spend a day in the Clarksville City Jail for stealing money, which I think looked really good on the resume when he was going to be a U.S. Marshal later on. Uh, there were a number of herbs that would serve in Illinois regiments in the family uh, in that part of Illinois. The second was a guy named Marion Morrison who would be grievously wounded in an anti-guerrilla patrol at Pine Bluff up, up uh, downstream from here about four or five miles. And then he will literally crawl through the woods for a couple of days and get picked up by a passing Civil War gunboat. Cemetery off to our left has a few guys that were killed by uh, in the Confederate Dunkers at Fort Henry that are interred there. But Mary Morse will go on and survive the war, and uh, he will have a family, and he will have a, uh, an offspring later on, whose name is also Marion Morrison, who will become a star football player for the University of Southern California, and later become one of America's most revered actors under the name of John Wayne. So if Marion Morrison dies here at the hands of Confederate guerrillas, there is no John Wayne. In the papers of the 83rd Illinois at the Lincoln Library in, in uh, Springfield, Illinois, I, I found one of their members was a very gifted artist and he actually sketched a bunch of things here. And and uh, in that was a, a picture of the cabins that the Federals will build at, at Fort Climate. So I made a copy of that and gave it to the park a few years ago. I also found an account in an Evansville, Indiana newspaper from the Indiana soldiers sent a letter home that described to a T what the cabins looked like of the Confederate garrison at Fort Donaldson. The one that they have built now doesn't look anything like it. They were 12 feet long, 8 feet wide, had open windows on each side, and had a chimney and upwards of the 6 to 8 bunks. So we're now sort of approximating the Telegraph Road route to Dover. When Grant will start moving over here after the 8th, uh, he tells Halleck he's going to head towards Donaldson and Dover on the 8th, but the rains set in and uh, he can't do it. They're too busy moving their supplies up to higher ground about every hour because the rivers are rising so much. Like as I said, they'll rise two feet an hour during this campaign. He needs to say the currents are going to be very swift. An ironclad gunboat on a good day will make seven knots. So if you're sailing upstream against a current that's pushing five knots, your boat is basically crawling. Which mainly, which means you're going to be under the eyes of the Confederate artillery for quite some time. Halleck is looking at his map and he's ordering Grant to go over to Clarksville to destroy the railroad bridge there without keeping in mind that Grant would have to get past the garrison at Fort Donaldson and in Dover to do so. And he sends notes back to Halleck and basically says, I can't do it until we reduce Clarksville or actually capture Donaldson because then we can move to Clarksville from there. <coughs> so this is another case of Halleck uh, pushing his support to do something he just physically cannot do. And because he's sitting up there in St. Louis and doesn't have eyes on at the actual front line, Halleck is basically out of touch. So about the 12th is when Grant will start pushing over. He has uh, eight companies of cavalry including a couple of regulars from the second United States, a couple of Illinois companies. Rand does not particularly use cavalry very well during the war, at least until Sheridan shows up. And Sherman never really uses his cavalry particularly well either uh, at, at any time during the war, particularly in the Atlanta campaign where two of his divisions get destroyed by Joe Wheeler. And this is a case of, of Grant not really using his cavalry particularly well to get out there and get eyes and ears on what's going on. They do bring back some intel to talk about the two roads so he's able to update his maps and he will push patrols out in this direction uh, and he will brush, uh, brush up against the Confederate picket line that's out a couple miles out in front of Fort Donaldson. Now if you look at this wonderful defensive terrain, like I said when I do Army staff rides, they always ask me did the Confederates come out here knowing there's only two roads uh, across and send a couple of brigades to each road and bushwhack Grant as he's coming over. 
I said, no, by that time, uh, Pillow, who's the ranking officer until Floyd shows up, uh, basically goes, uh, surrenders the initiative to Grant the entire time and will literally allow Grant to march up to the walls of Fort Donaldson. That's why if you read the accounts when he tells Buckner at the surrender, he says, if you had been in command here instead of Pillow, I would have uh, fought this campaign completely differently because Buckner was not going to let anybody just come marching up to your outer walls. If I'm in command here, I'm going to basically chop up Grant's columns piecemeal as they come across. This is fabulous terrain to do that in. It's a great account that you can find in Britain's memoir. He was Grant's chief surgeon. It's kind of too bad that John Rawlins, his chief of staff, didn't write a memoir, but Britain's memoir is quite good. And he talks about how uh, the horse that he rides is a fairly brisk animal, and, and on the uh, on the Potoma Furnace Ridge Road, uh, his horse constantly is getting in front of Grant, and that's when Grant kind of clears his throat and says, I believe I command this army surge in Britain, and I shall ride first. We all know the image of Grant as a cigar smoker. He did not smoke cigars until after his victory here. He was a pipe smoker prior to that time. And because of the win in Fort Donaldson, everybody will send him boxes of cigars to thank him, and of course those will kill him after the war, thanks to the throat cancer. Coming up here where the, uh, the telegraph road actually veers off to the right on the original roadbed, and when we get to it, I'll point it out to you. It's, you can still uh, four-wheel it and walk the whole thing. And it ends on the trace, which we're coming up to in a little bit. Here we go, where the stop sign is on the right-hand side, that's where the road turns and cuts across the angle. station here. They got Buffalo. The Brandon Spring is the Brandon homestead. The were Brandons that served in some of the Confederate units that came out of this area, which include the 49th and 50th Tennessee. Now I'll point out as we get down a little bit where that where the Telegraph Road pops out and then we'll follow the original roadbed for a bit and they'll show you where part of Smith's force, and particularly WHL Wallace's brigade, will turn to the left and head towards the north side of Fort Donaldson to uh, shut the door. The Eddyville Road is the door there that uh, crosses Hickman's Creek on a bridge. Again, this is part of Grant's plan. I, I want to capture the garrison. I do not want them to escape. So that's part of the closing the door policy. now. So the road to the right is original road. And it joins up where it's uh, cut off back in the LBL part. So McClernand, or excuse me, Wallace's guys are marching down this road. WHL Wallace will be killed at Shiloh. And 
and then he'll make a left turn and head towards the Eddyville Road, which is the road that runs through Fort Donaldson National Battlefield and on up to Eddyville, Kentucky, and crosses the Cumberland River several miles downstream. Actually, go down there as a turnaround for the bus, and you get a nice view of Fort Donaldson Battlefield across the creek. And that's where they shut the door. But with all the rain that had been happening here, the waters were so flooded. He sent a courier to Grant and says, There's no way the Confederates are going to get out this way because it's too flooded. So Grant will leave a couple cavalry units out that way and bring Wallace's brigade uh, down this road to join up with the Charles Ferguson Smith Division. This final issue start out with two divisions of Union Infantry, Smiths and, and uh, McClernand's. They'll end up getting the third division under Lou Wallace as more reinforcements come down. And at this phase of the campaign, the Confederates outnumber Grant by several thousand troops. Because they're pulling in reinforcements from Bowling Green, from Clarksville, from Hopkinsville and Russellville. Clark's Brigade, Buckers, half of Buckers Division comes here from Bowling Green. Clark's Brigade of Mississippi and Texas troops. They'll be under Baldwin when they get here. Clark will resign his commission because he's uh, upset about who ranks who. And he'll go back to be uh, wartime governor of Mississippi during the war. He is one of the six Confederate generals born in Ohio. opportunity for the Confederates to come out and do something if uh, their cavalry scouts will tell them what the Union troop strength is and dispositions they could have come out here and rolled up one, one flank or the other flank of Grant and probably defeated him before any reinforcements would get here in time but again Pillow surrenders that initiative and sits behind the dirt walls they don't even start digging the outer works at Fort Donaldson they've been here since the summer of 61 when they started building it they don't start building the dirt walls until after the fall of Fort Henry And instead of drilling and everything else, they're out here with ditches or with shovels and picks and things like that, throwing up dirt as fast as they can. because he's my friend and he's as big a book buying cornball as I am. And remember the slogan, he who dies with the most books wins. I have a box of books here, including the new Tullahoma book that came out last November that has a chapter that I wrote in on the Union Cavalry, the Tullahoma campaign. And a few other little tidbits in there as well. And I also have a book to return to Harriet that she gave me to get autographed and never could get a hold of the author to get it signed for. So if somebody could take Harriet the book back to her, that would be fabulous. Myself, Jim Lewis, Mike Bradley, and two professors at Middle Tennessee State. It's an application of essay. The hardback, paperback? Hey, it's only paper, but it's color. See, I, I had no idea. Who's the, the first name on the front? I got so sick of that. That's the way I filed. Oh, okay. It's probably said edited by David.